the scripture is Paul's letter to the Ephesian Christians. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Thank you. Well, you've, you've probably had the experience of in the middle of something going on, that could be something good, it could be something difficult, but something's going on, right? Right in the middle of that going on, you felt the need to stop and pray. Kind of reminds me of 1787 when things were not going well at the Continental Congress and old Ben Franklin, old Ben Franklin, he said, man, we got to pray. And that's what they did. And God answered their prayers. And what they ended up with was a nation. But they had to stop and they had to pray. Well, you know, we just, you, you feel that. Sometimes you come to that place where you say, well, we need to pray, right? We need to pray. And usually this happens. Um, and when this happens, this brief time of prayer, ha haven't you experienced this? You kind of stop, you pray, and what? It makes a difference, right? It does. You just sense it's like things start to clear up and things start, you know, and he starts to shut up and listen to you and that's just what happens. It makes a difference. It does. Well, Paul, Paul in this text, after uh, this opening greeting to the Ephesians, uh, he begins with several, th these are mind engaging subjects. These are, these are real thinkers. These, the, the kind of statements that he makes, uh, they require in-depth study and uh, thinking and thoughts. Um, and so that's what he does. And, and, and he touches on them. We, we, in fact, um, we touched on them last week and the week before, just a couple of things that we looked at. And he uses words like um, every spiritual blessing. Hey, try unpacking that. Every spiritual blessing. And he just casually says that. And then he says, chose us. He chose us. God chose us. And then he uses the word holy. You know, that's a subject you can't just skim over. Holy. Then Paul includes words like uh, predestination and adoption. Then he includes a series of statements in just a few sentences. He does this. That begin with the opening line, in him. That in Him, what? In Christ, what? We have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins. In Him, we have an inheritance. I, I, I want to know about that. What's my inheritance? And then being in Him, we, we have the Holy Spirit. And what Paul says about the Holy Spirit is breathtaking. And it's... it's well, it's ridiculous that the Holy Spirit dwells in, in him and in her and in me. Well, there was a, there's a lot in those few verses. And we're only talking about a few verses. We're talking about chapter 1, 3 through 14. 12 verses. And he intends for the, these subjects to become discussion questions. In fact, you know, lots of PhDs have written on these subjects. There are, there are libraries filled with books on those, just those verses. Heavy stuff. 
And Paul is heady. Peter talks about that, doesn't he? he Peter talks about that in one of his letters. He said, Paul, he, that, he's difficult to understand. Because Paul is heady. Heady. Heady stuff. And then he does something. It's so fascinating. He does something. You know, I never experienced this in seminary. Anybody go to seminary? You didn't miss much. Anyway, went to seminary. A professor, you know, a professor after lecturing on, on, on just going on something that was deep and something that's profound, some profound truth, and you don't know anything about this. I mean, you ever tried taking notes on subjects that you don't know anything about, and, and it's hard to follow, and they're going so fast, and you wish you could interrupt, but you don't want to raise your hand because you got to use your hand to take notes. Just too busy trying to keep up. In some of my seminary classes, we had study groups. We did. We had study groups, and we would meet. And the only thing we did was we'd read our notes because we knew that we were, we were incomplete, and we needed each other to fill in the blanks. Those, all of that was going to be on the test. But what Paul does, it's so fascinating, what Paul does right after he lays on them seven or eight gigantic subjects that he wants them to, to discuss and to contemplate, you know what he does? He breaks out in prayer. Yeah. And he begins his prayer, he starts it with the word, therefore. Which points to what he just said. That is, in light of what I just, he's saying, this is what I told you about you. Don't we love subjects in the Bible that are about us? We pay attention to those subjects that are about us. It's like the actor who is at a party. He said, I've, I've talked long enough about me. What do you think about me? Well, it starts with therefore. He says, in light of what I just told you about you. And he uses in that text, if you looked at those verses, you'd find the word you a lot. He'd find we and us. He's talking about us. So in light of these things, Paul says, I, Paul, the apostle, after he says earlier, after I heard about your faith, and uh, your faith and your, the, your knowledge and your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for all the saints, I do not stop giving thanks for you, making mentioning of you in my prayers. Yes, I do. And then Paul prays. How many letters have you gotten with prayer in it? He prays. He starts to pray for them. And we want to talk about that for just a moment. And he prays that God... God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Father, the Father who chose you, predestined you, who, who has uh, predestined, there's a predestiny for your life. God has something in mind for you, a calling for your life, for each one here, every Christian. Don't miss it. Don't mess it up. He prays to the, the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. If this, this prayer, you know, prayer should always be directed to the Father. Jesus, Jesus was asked uh, by the disciples, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, okay, take notes. And they said, okay. Begin this way. What? Our Father. Paul directing this prayer to the Father. We pray to the Father in Jesus' name. That's our authority. That's our right. We pray in Jesus' name. But we're praying to the Father. This whole section is about the Father and the blessings of the Father. He has blessed us. The Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Yes, He has. Every one of them. Every means every. And what is being asked by Paul is this, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you Give to you something. That, see, he's praying. God, give to them the spirit of wisdom 
You need wisdom. Anybody need wisdom? The spirit of wisdom and revelation, a revealing, a coming to see, coming to understand, taking the lid off, something that you can't, haven't seen before. God, give them an ability to see what they haven't seen before in the knowledge of Him, Christ. And then he explains this further, that the eyes of your understanding, you, you need understanding, being enlightened, that you may know. And the word know means to know, uh, seriously know, really know, deep down know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of His glory? God, I mean, there's so much to experience in the Christian life. What are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? Your inheritance then and now. You get part of it now. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power? Are you experiencing the greatness of His power? Because God wants you to. He wants you to be powerful. Christians should be powerful people. When you walk into the store, man, the light should flicker. <laughs> you should be po you're powerful. And look at this. Greatness of His power toward us who believe. Now, what does this have to do with us, really? Believe it or not, it has a lot to do with us. And so we have to review just really quick. Paul begins his prayer for them with the words, therefore, which means what? In light of what I just told you about you. Basically, what did he tell them? He told them about God, the Father, and his involvement in your life. That God has brought salvation into your life. And this salvation has occurred through what Christ has done on the cross by the means of the Spirit of God, that God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, has chosen you, and you have been saved, and it's a complete salvation. You don't have to add anything to it. He earned it for you. You get it from Him, by Him, through Him. And so He, he just in these first 12 verses, He talks about this. Now, are you listening? It's, it's one thing to read this. It's another thing to experience it. To actually start enjoying the chief end of man. You know, in the Westminster Confession of Faith, it asks this question. What is the chief end of man? To know God and what? Do you remember? And enjoy Enjoy Him forever. It's one thing to read the Word of God. It's another thing to experience it. To actually start enjoying what God has given to us. What is it given to us? Every spiritual blessing. Every one of them. They belong to you. So He prays. He prays. And here's why. You know why he prays? Because he knows this. Until the words in those verses become experiential to us, they will remain just words on paper. You can have a map, right? You can have a map detailing where a treasure is found. But unless, man, you... You, you, you put on the backpack and you grab the shovel and you start out there looking for this. You know, you're not going to get, you can have the map. But you got to go get the treasure. And that's what Paul is saying. Look, until the things stated ever so beautifully by Paul in the first 12 verses, these 12 verses, stated so profoundly clearly in the scripture until they leave the page and enter the heart they are quickly forgotten how do we know that because much of what Paul writes to the churches the other especially the Corinthian church man, they had forgotten in fact Paul says I wanted to deal with you as mature people but you know what you're so immature you're still on breast milk instead of meat 
And what happens when we begin to forget? We stay immature in Christ. We don't mature in Christ. And the Word, the Word is just words. So he prays for them. There's a scholar, his name is Max Anders, and he explains it this way. He says, and he's right, the complexity and magnitude of these truths in verses 1 to 14 is beyond the ability of us to comprehend or appreciate fully. He's right. Therefore, Paul follows the presentation of these truths with a prayer for our enlightenment. Okay, so an example. All right, Paul tells us, Paul tells us we have every blessing. We've inherited these blessings through believing in Jesus. They are now part of our inheritance in Christ. But are we experiencing them? Are you experiencing them? Here's an illustration. When Israel has been set free, they, they are enslaved, right? There's something worse than slavery, right? And that's being in sin. Sin is the worst slave master. Slave, sin will control your life. Well, Israel is being controlled, literally. They're slaves. They're in Egypt. And now they are set free after 400 years. And now 40 years, they're wandering. Right? Wandering. They're just the wandering Jews. And they're wandering. And they start at Kadesh Barnea. And 40 years later, they're at Kadesh Barnea, wandering around in circles. Don't be a Christian that wastes your life wandering. And a lot of Christians do. Just going around in circles, round in circles, round in circles, round in circles, not knowing what God wants for your life. And so finally, after 40 years, it's Joshua. And they're about ready to enter the promised land. And it is Joshua who is responsible to take them into the land of promise. It was promised to them by God. And now they are ready, finally, to take possession. Don't wait till you're 80 years old to find out what God wants you to do. You should be about 13 or 14 years old and start. And don't waste your life, right? Like a lot of these old people. Don't do that. So they're ready. And Joshua, what? He leads them. Leads them into the promised land. And, but God tells Joshua this in Joshua 1, verse 3. Every place on which the sole of your feet treads, I have given it to you. Just as I spoke to Moses. That is, I told Moses over here. Now you're over here and you're getting to take it. But they wasted a lot of time. Obadiah when was the last time you read Obadiah? Oh, well, just this morning. Obadiah <laughs> speaks of this also. Obadiah 1 verse 7. He talks about, in that verse, he talks about Israel uh, possessing their possession. Possessing. Now comes how it connects to us and today. God has already given Israel the land of promise. But it was their responsibility to go into the land and possess their possessions. Are you listening? That was Israel's responsibility to possess their possession. They had to step out by faith Trusting God all the way, taking a hold of what had already been given to them. It was theirs. Paul's prayer is similar. God has given us every spiritual blessing. By the way, Jesus leads us into it. And isn't it interesting that the Hebrew name for Jesus is what? Joshua. Jesus is the ultimate Joshua. Our Joshua, through him, we enter into the spiritual land of promise. And that is every spiritual blessing. And yet each one of us must step out by faith 
Maybe you've been wasting time. Maybe you've been wasting your life. And maybe today is a day to start stepping out by faith. Stop wasting it. Wasting your life. Step out by faith and take a hold of God's precious, as Peter says, magnificent promises. And, and as we do, you won't believe it. I saw in the Word something. And, and so I uh, was in my prayer closet and I saw it there. And man, I wanted that more than anything in my own life. So I got in the prayer closet. I, at one of my churches, I had a big closet. So I just dubbed that my prayer closet. And I went into that closet. I even had a, a lamp in the closet. And I'd get on my knees, open the Word. And I just saw in the Word, here's the promise of God. And God, I want this promise. I'm going to step by faith into this land of promise. And I asked God to do what was in the Word in my life. I wanted it more than anything. And you know what he did? He did it. And I can tell you, I can testify that my life has not been the same. My ministry has not been the same as a result of what God did. Your life will not be the same as a result of what God will do in your life when you start to believe God and take a hold of His promises. The things that God wants to give you that you can't imagine. God wants to give you wisdom. Wisdom that is beyond your intelligence. He wants to give you revelation. He wants to give you enlightenment. He wants to give you knowledge. He wants to give you understanding. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit's power. And Paul describes it in the first chapter. The question we must answer today is, am I at the place where I am willing to step out by faith and take a hold of these spiritual blessings. Now, how do you do it? You, just like when I was in seminary, man, you cannot neglect study. The Bible says study. You've got to get into the Word. You've got to study the Word. You've got to study. Secondly, you have to pray. Pray. You've got to pray. You have to have an attitude of prayer. When you're studying the Word, you've got to have an attitude of prayer. But we must then take a hold of the map, the Scripture, and step into the land, into the Bible, and begin to incorporate what God shows us in the Word, into our own life. The Word must become flesh and dwell in us. It must be incorporated in our lives. And when it is, listen, the blessings written on paper will start becoming reality in our own life. It's one thing to know them. It's one thing to know. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. But here's God's will. God's will for your life is that you experience them. Those who are chosen by Him, He chose you to experience every spiritual blessing. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, and God is working on you today, touching your heart, hey, don't put it off. The Bible says this, if you hear Him knocking, open the door. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that we can harden our own heart. We're soft toward God right now, but tomorrow... It'll change. So if you haven't opened your heart to Christ, you open your heart today. If God's working on your life today, today is the day of salvation. Open your heart to Him. Let me lead you in a very simple prayer. Would you pray together? Lord Jesus, we come before you with hearts filled with gratitude and thanksgiving for what you have done for us. You have made all this possible. The church wouldn't exist apart from you. And today, Lord, we're so thankful that we see that we have these things, but we've got to, like Israel, we've got to enter the land. That's the responsibility you've given to Christians. You're just not going to spoon feed us. You want us to learn to eat for ourselves. And so, Lord God, I pray that if someone here, one person, is outside of faith, that's a dangerous place to be. And if today, Lord, today you are speaking to their heart, I pray for
for you, brother, for sister, you sister, that you'll open your heart to Jesus. He's knocking, it's God knocking. And you open the door of your heart right now. And you invite Jesus to come into your life. And what He will do is invite you to come into His life. Would you do that right now? Open the door of your heart and your life will change today. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. All right. After the service is over, um, you know, we like to eat around here. And so we have some wonderful, we have some beautiful cupcakes out there. And we would love for you to take one home. And we'd love for you to hang around a little bit. And let us get to know you if you want to. If you, if you want to get to know us. And you want, it'll hurt our feelings if you don't. But um, please, stay after and, and grab something sweet. And don't forget tonight, 3 o'clock. Um, ice cream Sundays on Sundays, what could be better? And then the hymn sing will start about 3.15. So let's stand and we're going to sing our closing hymn.
Would you receive the benediction? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with his peace. Amen. Amen.